If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency and vibration. Nikola Tesla Although modern scientists are just now beginning to understand this quote from Tesla, ancient civilizations around the world had known of the power of sound frequency and vibration for thousands of years. Words and vibrations have an immense power, which the ancients often utilized for many purposes. In this video, we'll examine not only the ancient practices, but also the scientific findings of the power of vibrations. How scientists are currently using vibrations and frequencies to alter and reprogram the DNA of living beings, and how the Tibetans use sound for levitating and transporting heavy stones. Every molecule and atom in this universe is vibrating at a particular frequency. Resonance frequency would be considered the specific frequency of that specific object or atom. Once you know the resonant frequency, or a specific frequency of an object or an atom, you can amplify its waves, making it so big that eventually, it will break or destroy the object. That's what happens when we stimulate a wine glass with the frequency that matches its resonance frequency. Using the same principle in 1938, a scientist named Dr. Royal Raymond Reif cured 16 terminally ill cancer patients. Royal Reif designed a healing device using only electromagnetic frequencies, to target and destroy any disease. This discovery should have completely changed the medical industry, but for unknown reasons. This information has been suppressed. Although a massive campaign of suppression was conducted, many other scientists confirmed Reif's discovery by testing his frequency healing device. The result was the elimination of 60% of cancer cells from patients, only through the power of resonant frequency. Although the FDA made sure everything from this healing technology was destroyed, recently a professor of music by the name of Anthony Holland, who is also a composer, was always interested in the physical effects of sound, so he decided to assemble a lab to examine the effects of audio frequencies on microbiology. Dr. Holland created a nonprofit organization for this purpose and began his experiments with harmless microorganisms like paramecium. What he discovered was, just like the wine glass, a particular combination of two related frequencies would completely shatter the targeted cells. After this experiment, he went out to find out the frequencies that could break cancer cells. After a year of research, just like Royal Rife, he found out their frequencies to combat pancreatic cancer and leukemia cells. In various experiments he successfully destroyed 60% of the cells, just like Royal Rife did. This is nothing new. Cases of using sound to achieve healing and supernatural results can be found in almost all ancient civilizations. Even today, shamans use different instruments and rituals for different healing purposes. In a shamanic healer's toolkit, the most used and essential healing agent is the Icaros, a sacred song sung by the doctor to the patient, to stimulate the natural well-being and health of the patient. This song is also used in spiritual practices with ayahuasca. There was much electromagnetic power in the specific instruments and sound-based rituals performed by ancient civilizations. They're not some voodoo tricks. They are pure science, used by the ancients. Besides the applications of this knowledge for healing, there was also evidence of how the ancients used sound, vibrations and frequencies to carve and levitate heavy stones and objects and use them to build megalithic structures. It's believed the Egyptians had a device that could be tuned to a specific frequency, and with it, they were able to cut massive stones, just as if they were cutting butter. If you don't believe such technology could exist, just look at the Almanzar Rock Formation, located in Tima Oasis, Saudi Arabia. Or the Pumapunka Complex, with dozens of stones, all cut with laser-like precision. In 1939, a Swedish doctor named Dr. Jarl was brought to a Tibetan monastery to treat a high lama. He stayed a long time at the monastery and became a close friend of the Tibetans. Dr. Jarl stayed there for some time, and because of his friendship with the Tibetans, he learned a lot of things that other foreigners had no chance to hear about or observe. One day his friend took him to a place in the neighborhood of the monastery and showed him a sloping meadow, which was surrounded in the northwest by high cliffs. In one of the rock walls, at a height of about 250 meters, was a big hole which looked like the entrance to a cave. In front of this hole, there was a platform on which the monks were building a rock wall. The only access to this platform was from the top of the cliff, and the monks lowered themselves down with the help of ropes. 
In the middle of the meadow, about 250 meters from the cliff, was a polished slab of rock with a bowl-like cavity in the center. The bowl had a diameter of 1 meter and a depth of 15 centimeters. A block of stone was maneuvered into this cavity by yak oxen. The block was 1 meter wide and 1.5 meters long. Then 19 musical instruments were set in an arc of 90 degrees, at a distance of 63 meters from the stone slab. The radius of 63 meters was measured out accurately. The musical instruments consisted of 13 drums and 6 trumpets. Ragdons. Eight drums had a cross-section of 1 meter and a length of 1.5 meters. Four drums were medium-sized with a cross-section of 0.7 meters and a length of 1 meter. The only small drum had a cross-section of 0.2 meters and a length of 0.3 meters. All the trumpets were the same size. They had a length of 3.12 meters and an opening of 0.3 meters. The big drums and all the trumpets were fixed on mounts, which could be adjusted with staffs in the direction of the slab of stone. The big drums were made of 1 mm thick sheet iron and had a weight of 150 kilograms. They were built in five sections. All the drums were open at one end, while the other end had a bottom of metal, on which the monks beat with big leather clubs. Behind each instrument was a row of monks. When the stone was in position, the monk behind the small drum gave a signal to start the concert. The small drum had a very sharp sound and could be heard even with the other instruments making a terrible din. All the monks were singing and chanting a prayer, slowly increasing the tempo of this unbelievable noise. During the first four minutes nothing happened. Then as the speed of the drumming and the noise increased, the big stone block started to rock and sway, and suddenly, it took off into the air with an increasing speed, in the direction of the platform in front of the cave hole, 250 meters high. After three minutes of ascent, it landed on the platform. Continuously they brought new blocks to the meadow, and the monks, using this method, transported five to six blocks per hour. Dr. Jarl was the first foreigner who had the opportunity to see this remarkable spectacle. Because he had the opinion in the beginning that he was the victim of mass psychosis, he made two films of the incident. The films showed exactly the same things that he had witnessed. The English society for which Dr. Jarl was working confiscated the two films and declared them classified. The fact that the films were immediately classified is not very hard to understand once the given measurements are transposed into their geometric equivalents. It then becomes evident that the monks in Tibet are fully conversant with the laws governing the structure of matter, which the scientists in the modern-day Western world are now frantically exploring. It appears that the prayers being chanted by the monks did not have any direct bearing on the fact that the stones were levitated from the ground. The reaction was not initiated by the religious fervor of the group, but by the superior scientific knowledge held by the high priests. The secret is in the geometric placement of the musical instruments, in relation to the stones to be levitated, and the harmonic tuning of the drums and trumpets. The combined loud chanting of the priests, using their voices at a certain pitch and rhythm, most probably adds to the combined effect. The sound waves being generated by the combination were directed in such a way that an anti-gravitational effect was created at the center of focus and around the periphery, or the arc, of a third of a circle through which the stones moved. The instruments used by the group, in theory, would have been tuned to produce harmonic wave forms associated with the unified fields. The geometric arrangement and the number of instruments in the group would also be a most important factor. When the circular pattern was formed, it became evident that the Tibetans had placed the drums and trumpets on the arc of a quarter circle, but the placement of the priests behind the drums tended to form a spiral. This conforms with the concept of the formation of matter due to the spiraling, vortexual, wave motions in space. Similar wave motions would have to be created in order to manipulate matter. This is direct eyewitness evidence of existing Tibetan techniques of acoustic levitation, using drums and giant trumpets made of resonant metal alloys, in combination with concave piezoelectric stone transducers, to focus the sounds produced. In the middle of the meadow, about 250 meters from the cliff, was a polished slab of rock with a bowl-like cavity in the center. The bowl had a diameter of 1 meter and a depth of 15 centimeters. Use of such instruments has also been clearly identified in the ancient cultural context of the Nile region of Egypt, where large levitation instruments litter the area surrounding the pyramids at Giza. Such instruments have also been found with the megalithic passage chambers of Ireland, at Noth, Douth and Newgrange. The abundance of clear and direct evidence for the advanced acoustic levitation techniques of the ancient pyramid builders is being completely ignored by the concerned historians and academics. The question is, why?
In 2015, a device built by a team from Spain successfully levitated and manipulated small objects with just sound. And here's an interesting old video of an acoustic levitation device by Dr. David Deek. One other recent discovery made by scientists was how sound frequencies and vibrations have the power to program, or reprogram, our DNA. In 2011, the Russian biophysicist Peter Jerdyaf conducted several experiments modifying DNA, using only sound and light frequencies. The experiment was outstanding. He and his team successfully transformed frog embryos to salamander embryos simply by transmitting the DNA information patterns through frequency alone. In today's science, there is a term called junk DNA, which basically tells us that 97% of our DNA is useless and has absolutely no purpose, but could nature be so inefficient? I don't think so. This so-called junk DNA could be the key to unlocking our full potential and activating not only self-healing, but many other abilities that are considered supernatural.